I'm Billy. Uh, I looked into some software called Tritium. I'm going to talk to you about Tritium. Uh, it's an ICS case study, really, because it's kind of the same template for every single ICS vendor we've ever dealt with. Uh, and it's actually really bad, but um, we'll go over a lot of different things. So this is me. I work at Google. I used to work at Microsoft. Um, did a lot of cool stuff, I guess. Um, one thing, though, is like if you have a background in any of this kind of stuff, like if you deal with real security, and then you jump into the industrial control systems world, uh, it's, it's pretty horrific. So uh, I've also published some books. <clears throat> and there's been like a lot of publicly credited ICS vulnerability stuff advisories that have come out over the last year. Um, and you can actually read about those. But the thing that sucks about them is they don't have any details, right? So let me just sit there. <laughs> and so, and I used to always hate that. I used to be always like, man, there's some code execution bug, random code execution bug. And so, uh, but I don't have any details about it, so I don't know how to emulate or replicate it or whatever, right? So, we gotta stay still. We gotta sit right there. Don't move around, okay? <laughs> That's my daughter, everyone, Alyssa. So, uh, there's 30 credited voter like advisories. We actually reported over a thousand different issues uh, to the Department of Homeland Security. So, and they're still just like trudging their way through them. When we gave them those bugs, we literally said, "Hey, we don't even want to. We don't want to know what's happening with these. We don't want follow up." We don't want emails. We don't want to talk to vendors. Uh, we really don't care because at that point we were like, we just kind of had it. So um, this is the message. It's pretty cool, huh? Arbitrary ownage, right? Obviously, it's PGP message. Um, we sent these to ICS Cert. They have a lab in, at INL, which is the Idaho National Laboratories. That's where their like legitimate dudes are, right? Like when they get issues and you send them to DHS, DHS will be like, oh, this is really cool, and then. Uh, then they'll, they won't admit to you that they don't understand it. What they really do is they send it to these guys over at INL, and the INL guys look at them and be like, oh, yeah, this is actually kind of cool. So uh, it's just kind of like how their, their hier hierarchy is established. So, And then many, many, many months later, you get something like this, right? So this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, you'll get some update that says, hey, this new framework is out. Everyone should download this patch. Um, it's uh, 3.5 and 3.6. So if you're on any version before that, we're not going to patch you. You're just out there. Um, and then you have to figure out exactly what the change is, right, in order to figure out what the vulnerability was. And then once you figure out what the vulnerability was, you have to figure out how to exploit it, right? So, And normally, it's like really, really simple and straightforward if you know what the vulnerability was. But if you don't, then you have to go trudging through all this stuff, right? And, uh, and obviously, they're very detailed about what the vulnerabilities are, right? So like in this one, it says, hey, this addresses a directory traversal bug and a weak credential storage. Um, they were disclosed to us. And then in addition, there's two other vulnerabilities with weak session IDs and like the default encoding of credentials and authentication cookies. So like, who knows what that means, right? So, But uh, it sounds like it's pretty serious. You should probably download it uh, and install the patch. So this slide is basically on the disclosure piece of it, right? So. When we did our ICS research, we reported everything to the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and there's a couple different reasons for that. The first reason is we didn't want to talk directly with these vendors because we have no idea how they're going to react. Because this is, this is not a modern security company or a modern software company. This is like an old school industrial control systems vendor that we're dealing with. And uh, a lot of times they don't treat researchers very nicely. So what we figured is, is if we talk to DHS first, and had DSH actually, uh, DSH actually reach out to these vendors, we'd probably get a lot more traction. So that's what we did on this particular bug, as with many others. And we actually reached out to them. I looked at my email box, inbox, and it was January 28th. We said, hey, you got some issues. And, uh, and then on April 17th, they're like, OK, yeah, you're right. They're, these are issues, right? These are vulnerabilities. So uh, this is video. <laughs> yeah, of us. I, when we first contacted Tritium, this is them, right? They're like, whatever, man. And so, uh, and then over the le the next couple weeks, this is basically how the timeline went, right? So, uh, the blue is Tritium and the red is us. So they're saying, hey, you're right. You're right. Uh, this is bad. This is really bad. Uh, we're we're gonna fix these issues. We'll fix these issues. And we said, uh, hey, you know, that's cool. And then later they're like, hey, wait, you know what? Uh, we're actually not gonna fix this. And uh, we go, like, what? Why not? And uh, and they're like, oh, I don't know. And, they just wouldn't answer us. They just they, they, they wouldn't even respond. And so finally, the director of control system security at DHS 
actually reached out to these guys and said, hey, actually, uh, you guys should like really fix these because this is actually really bad. So, and, and then they're like, they got back to us and they're like, okay, yeah, you're right, we'll fix it. And so we said, oh, yeah, that's cool. And then a couple weeks later, they're like, hey, wait, when we told you we we're going to fix this, what we really meant is we're not going to fix this. And then they're like, oh, yeah, hey, don't tell anyone about this stuff. And so <laughs> we're like, all right, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so like this is us. We're like, we're like, you know what? Okay, man. I mean, <laughs> we got no other recourse, right? It's like, geez, these guys are just horrible. So, um, so usually, like when you go to a talk, they wait to hold the bugs to like the very end. But we're just going to hold the bugs right away, right? And then uh, if you don't care about how they work, you can just take these bugs and start using them against systems on the internet. I mean, you can start using these against systems during a pen test um, and then be cool, right? So, but um, the bugs are the sessions that are created when you authenticate to one of these systems. They're basically like nine bits, right? So uh, in modern days, that's not sufficient to protect anything, really. So, and then the other thing is like, hey, the username and passwords, they're basically stored in the cookies, right? So if you get owned by some like lame bug, like XSS or something, your actual whole installation kind of goes down, right? That's not, that's not good. And then the last bug is we called it a privilege escalation bug, and they kind of refer to it as a directory traversal bug. But um, you could just make this request to a Niagara Tritium server and get a file called config.bog, right? This file right here. So, and config.bog actually contains all the usernames and passwords for all the users on the device. So, <laughs> OK. It's always a good idea to have all these. I mean, just in case you forget, right? So. Um, those are the bugs we reported to them. So the, re <laughs> the reason we didn't make a big deal about the first two bugs is because every single installation that we've seen either had a default credential or allowed you guest access without authenticating, right? So that's why, <laughs> that's why we're like, if you don't fix the first two bugs, we don't really give a shit. But the last one you should probably fix, right? So, and this is what a config.bog file looks like. So when you make that request that we showed a couple slides ago, um, it makes it downloads this file. It actually downloads this compressed file first, and then inside that compressed file is this file, which is the real config.bog file. The config.bog file is actually the configuration file for that whole device, right? And all it is is an XML file, and this is what it looks like. Uh, and there's all sorts of crap in there, like tons of crap in there. And um, but most importantly, all the usernames and the permissions for that user and their password, right? Like see right here, password, that's password. Um, it's, in, it's encrypted. It's not, inc it's not encrypted. It's encrypted. Um, it, they're all in this config.bog file. So, and this is actually Tritium's config.bog file for the demo instance that they were running. So, and the reason I had this was when we first actually told them about this vulnerability, um, we actually exercised all the vulnerabilities against their demo, web, demo deployment that they have. So, because we didn't have access to these things, because these things are actually super expensive. Um, and they're like, oh, we don't believe you. Like, theoretically, what you're saying is possible, uh, but we don't think it, it's actually real. And they're like, if you could show us proof that this would actually work against a real installation, uh, we'd really appreciate that. And uh, we said, oh, we can't do that, but trust us, you should, you should test this. And they're like, uh, in a normal installation, given the way that things are configured and the guidance that we give, no one would ever deploy in this state. And then once they said that to us, we're like, here's a config.bog file for your installation. And, uh, and this is basically what it took to say, okay, yeah, this is real in April. So a couple months had gone by. Um, at first, we thought these were encrypted passwords because we actually got to look at some of the client code that they have. Um, and there are references to encryption. So we like, this, is mu this must be encrypted. But once you look at like, you know, two or three or four or five or ten different uh, sets of creds, you'll realize that that's not actually not encrypted. It's actually a, a custom like encoding mechanism that they have to basically protect those passwords. So, and they haven't changed that at all. Um, but what I, want, what I really want to do is give you guys kind of an understanding of what Tritium is. So because I'm guessing that probably most of you have never heard of it. Um, and, in fact, when we, fought, when we started looking at it, we'd never heard of it either. So we had gone to their website and we're like, who uses this stuff, right? And it turns out like a lot of people use this. In fact, they brag about the people that use this software, um, one of which is the Army, right? Like, okay, that's cool. But they also tell you, like, hey, here's this other stuff that, these, here's these other people that use our, our software, um, and here's what they're using it for. And so basically, they use it for all sorts of stuff, right? Usually, when you think of like industrial control systems or SCADA or whatever, um, you think of like power plants and water plants and all sorts of weird stuff like that. 
but the reality is, is that I'm guessing that most of you are actually probably running this somewhere in your network. So, because this is used everywhere. This is actually Tritium Niagara, the Niagara AX framework is actually the most prevalent ICS software in the world. So, uh, every place that I've ever had a chance to look, like they've had a Tritium machine or Boxer deployment somewhere. So, it's, it's, ev it's everywhere. It's really everywhere. So, um, this is from their slides, actually. Uh, so, if you call them and you say, hey, you know what? I'm not really sure how your software works. Can you tell me how it works? Because I'm interested in buying it. Not that I would ever do that. Um, they will give you this demo. They'll say, hey, so right now the way control systems work is like this, where each control system basically is managed by its own workstation, right? And it's important to look at the, these, this is their slides. This is their material. So, but it's important to look at the control systems that they're actually talking about, right? So they're not talking about water and power uh, and critical infrastructure, which this is used in, by the way. But what they really want to talk to you, if you're an enterprise, they're going to say, hey, you know what, your card access system, like when someone badges into the door, um, that's managed by some card access system somewhere, some workstation. And they go, hey, what you should really do is not manage it the way that you're managing it. And same with your video systems, like the cameras that are working in your, in your enterprise, like your Fortune 500 enterprise for your campus or whatever, uh, and your intrusion alarms, right? Like when someone uh, kicks a door or breaks into your data center or whatever, and that intrusion alarm goes off, like that's actually managed by some other weird system. And so, and then they say, oh yeah, it's so diverse and so complex, um, that's not good. That's basically like the problem that they're trying to solve, right? So, eh, you know, like conceptually, it's like, hey, you know what, that kind of makes sense. So. What Tritium wants to do is actually be right here, right? So they want to have their deployments like right here. So one person, one operator can manage all this stuff, right? And so, and it, it's actually pretty complicated because your intrusion system, your video systems, your card access systems, they probably actually use some like proprietary protocol um, that no one else supports. <laughs> and, like that's how I feel right now. Like, uh, that no one else supports, that probably no one else really understands. And it's very difficult to write like middleware for that. But what they've done is they've taken all these protocols and all this other stuff and they, they understand that stuff. So where they can have like a single interface. All you gotta do is interface with this and the Tritium Niagara frameworks, they just manage all this stuff for you. So um, it actually works very well. So like when they told people this, uh, people were actually really interested in this because it is kind of difficult to manage all this stuff. I don't know if anyone's ever done a pen test on a, like a big Fortune 500 and you've come across like these systems they're usually really horrible, right? They're just like sitting under someone's desk or something like that, and, uh, and they actually manage very important things. Like your card access system is actually really important. It's super important, right? But it's written by some weird vendor that you never heard of, and the deployment's usually really crappy, right? So these guys want to help you manage that. Um, and they actually say that they can do it like securely, right? They're like, hey, we can do this in a secure way. That's one of their selling points. So, and they don't want to stop there. They want to go all out, right? They're like, hey, we want to manage everything. So not only your card access system, but your video system, your intrusion system, but hey, we can all also do environmental controls for your building. And we can also do lighting. And one thing that's not on their slide deck, which they also do is power management. So um, when we did some audits and stuff, we came across these devices. We're telling some VP, they're like, hey, why do we even need to have power management systems for our data centers, right? And, uh, and it actually kind of makes sense. Like, you're, even if you have a virtual deployment, you're not going to send an engineer to push the power button on a thousand different machines to shut off for some maintenance window, right? Like, you have to do that in an automated fashion. It's, it's just impossible to do it any other way. Same with your environmental controls, right? Like, you cannot have an engineer go to a thermostat and adjust the thermostat manually to say, I don't know, maybe the computers are a little too hot, right? Like, let's turn this down. It's all automated, right? Like, temperature triggers, that triggers an AC to turn on. The temperature drops, the AC turns off, and this is all viewed by some guy at a computer miles away that says the temperature is green, right? And that's all they care about. And when the temperature turns yellow or red, then they know they have a problem, and that's when they actually send some guy down to actually look at it, but not until that point, right? So from a, from a conceptual standpoint, it actually sounds really good, right? Like, uh, you know, Tritium and their Niagara AX framework wants to be here and they want to be that single point of failure from a management standpoint, an operational standpoint, and a security standpoint to make sure that all this stuff down here is working, right? So this is Tritium's first security engineer. They're just like, <laughs> just like, like no, 
right? <laughs> like, no, this shit is not happening. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually the hardware that they're building their software on, right? So, yeah. I mean, this is what I would have done if I would have like heard that they wanted to do this. Okay, so, um, and then there's more stuff. These are the, these are basically scenarios that they want to handle. So, like for the the card access system, what they want is when someone badges into some place, it generates some event. Um, and the event goes to the card access system, and they want that card access system to basically feed into uh, the Tritium framework, the, the Niagara framework, right? Same with video. And they're like, hey, you know what? Uh, we need to start initiate recording, and the way we do that is over HTTP. So Tritium needs to understand HTTP instructions to a camera system, right? Same with intrusion. Like, hey, someone's just broken into this thing, or I need to turn off an alarm. Instead of going to the alarm system and using their software, you'll use Tritium to basically turn the alarm off or disable the alarm for a specific zone. Elevators, these are examples that they gave me. Now, I'm not just making these examples up. So elevators, right? So um, a lot of buildings, they have badging on the elevator where you badge into the elevator and the elevator says, no, you're not allowed to get to floor three, right? Well, that's actually software on the back end that says, what does this badge have access to, right? And so what they want to do is say, hey, you know what? I want this user to be able to get to floor three. I'll just use Tritium Niagara AX to tell the elevator that this guy has granted access to floor three. HVAC, the same thing, environmental controls, um, the AC that's in your buildings, basically in your data centers. Lighting uh, over Modbus, over here, energy. And then also at the very end, they, like, they want to manage everything, right? So like even the billing. So if you own like an apartment complex or a large condominium high rise condo, and you want to bill users for their energy usage or their HVAC usage or whatever, it actually keeps track of all that stuff and it'll just send an invoice to some certain thing via like a SMTP. So, but the cool thing though, like the thing that I was very interested in when they were talking about this is all these different protocols that it's speaking, right? Like this, this one device is kind of speaking all these different protocols. And so that's, that's really good for me because when you start to dabble in the ICS world, you'll understand that you have to actually learn all these protocols to kind of figure out how to drive the devices that are on the other end, right? And it can be actually complicated because you have to relearn, you have to learn all this new crap, right? That's kind of like someone coming up to you and saying, hey, you know what? TCP IP has totally changed, so now you got to relearn it. And now you got to relearn, you got to relearn like 10 or 15 or 20 different times. And sometimes the vendors have their own custom protocols that they use, which you have to go to their vendor website and learn about all, how all this crap works, so. Or you can learn how Tritium AX works, Niagara AX, and just use that to, do the protocol interaction for you, right? Abstract that away from you. So that's why it's very valuable. So let's look at the security design for like a typical network. So pen testers, this is, this is where you'll like get your bread and butter, right? Your money. So typically if you ask someone about their industrial control systems, if you say, hey, how do we do the badge access system? That's kind of a SCADA system or an ICS system. How do we do that? What they'll say is like, oh, it's segregated. We got this awesome firewall and like one guy can basically access the HMI, which is the human machine interface. That's like the Tritium box. And that Tritium box basically kind of controls all this stuff down here. So that's kind of neat, right? And then you have your historian that just kind of captures data, events, and all that sort of stuff. So, so the reality is it's like more like this, right? Where like you accidentally put your HMI on the internet and, the inter and like from the internet someone can actually control some device that's in your network. Right, and so, and I know you've seen slides like this before, like, ah, oh, there's no way. Uh, no one would ever put this crap out on the internet, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll touch more about on that later. So, but as far as Tritium goes, their design's a little bit different, right? So what they have is they have this AX server, um, that's a device usually. It can be put on a machine, but it's usually a device. Um, and this thing is usually connected directly to whatever it is that you want to control, right? And then from there, you manage this, you manage this, from some workstation. And by, by workstation, what they mean is either custom software that they've written or over HTTP, because this thing has a web server. Because everything has a web server nowadays. Like even a Siemens S7 PLC, they have all got web servers on them to manage them, right? And then to make things even more awesome is like they have this applet where the workstation and the applet are actually talking to each other. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And sometimes the applet actually talks to the server directly, right? So. So if you can own this thing, you can basically just like own all this stuff by design. That's basically what I'm trying to get at. So there's communications between the workstation and the, and the, and the server. There's also communications between the applet and the workstation. So that's, that's actually very important, especially if you're trying to attack these systems. Because there's a, like what will happen is like there's various properties that are getting passed 
between the DOM and the applet, the DOM of the browser that's kind of in the web management interface and the applet that make weird things happen. Because sometimes the applet's just going to do a direct socket connection back to the server and say, you need to do this. But it doesn't do that until it gets instruction from the web browser and, and vice versa. So, and then there's tons of functionality that happen on the client side. So what happens is like when you write these client applications and they're robust and they're huge, sometimes you forget you're writing a client application. So they do tons of stuff on the client that they probably shouldn't do. Like they do password hashing, they do encryption, and they like build SQL statements and all sorts of crazy stuff, right? So, um, and this is what a box looks like. Like if you buy a Tritium Niagara AX machine or a box or device, this is what it looks like. So I have one, this is mine right here. So if you open that box, this is what you see inside, right? So it's not magic, it's not a mystical device, there's not a unicorn inside, that's what I was expecting. I was like gonna open it and there's a unicorn in there that speaks Modbus and Profibus and all that stuff. It's actually a computer, right? It's just a computer inside. So um, if we look at some of the components, like this over here is a battery. So if the power goes out, this device can actually stay online, right? And you connect this battery, this connector right here up to that little port right there. And this is actually the power supply. So, and this is kind of a, I put this in here because it's important, if you're gonna work with ICS components, if you're gonna say, hey, you know what, I wanna start owning this stuff because I heard it's really easy, uh, and people freak out because you can like turn lights off and on and stuff like that. Uh, you're gonna have to learn a little about, about electricity because a lot of times these things don't, as you can see, that, that's not a plug. You, you cannot like plug that into your wall because um, you'll get hurt. So actually for this device, you probably could, but, uh, but you have to know that, right? So like the Tritium device takes, hey, 117 volts, it operates at this amperage, and it's expecting this type of current, right? You have to know that kind of stuff because every single ICS component that I've ever purchased, like a PLC or a Tritium box or whatever, they don't come with a plug. So you have to figure out how to hook it up and get power to it. Um, in this case, it's actually very straightforward. This can basically be plugged into like a 110 outlet, and I think it pulls like an amp and a half or something like that. So you could literally just take a cord, cut it, hook it up, plug it into the wall, and you'll be okay. So, but for other devices, it's not so straightforward, right? Because other devices expect DC or something like that, so you have to buy an adapter, hook it up, make sure the right voltage is going across, so you don't fry your box, you don't kill yourself. So. Um, here's another close-up of the actual board. So then I'll just point out some uh, interesting components. That up there is the RJ45 jack. So it's built in to the board. And so, and I always mention this because like when you talk to the vendors, they're like, we never meant for this to be plugged into the network. And you're like, well, you fucking embedded a RJ45 jack onto the board. So uh, it's probably pretty much meant to be plugged into the network, right? So, and you should say that to them when they said, we never meant for this to be networked. Like there's a built-in network jack on, on the board. So, but there's also dial-in. So that's an RJ11 jack right there. So you can actually plug it into a phone line. And I, I think that's actually a very overlooked area in this field because Everything that can be connected over the network, which is the new trend. Now they're trying to network everything. But it also has an RJ11 jack somewhere, usually, which you can dial into this thing. And it's just as bad, right? So um, this over here, those are COM ports. So those two, those two ports that I have highlighted, those are just straight up like RS232 ports where you can just plug something in and just speak, start speaking serial to something, right? And RS232 is pretty standard, so uh, a lot of ICS, SCADA components, they speak over serial, right? So, and then these are the same thing. So, except these are like RS-485. So, but it's just like serial though, right? So just so they can connect to various devices. Um, and then this little thing up there is basically what's called ION. It's just a popular uh, protocol that a lot of different ICS vendors are using. So, so what you would basically do is put this box somewhere and hook this into your devices, right? So that's why that network jack becomes so important. Right, because if I can get to this device and make it do things that's not supposed to, I can control whatever it is that, that's connected to it, right? And so, and which brings up another problem. So, and this is when we first started talking to you, DHS and ICS, so they're like, well, we know you found all these vulnerabilities, but what do these actually mean? What does a vulnerability in the Niagara AX framework actually mean? And we had to tell them, we don't know, right? This is not something that's only used in water or power or HVAC or building, whatever. It's, we just don't know, right? So. Every implementation that you find, there's no way for you to know what's connected to it unless you actually get onto this device or have someone tell you, right? Like an industrial control systems engineer. So, 
Um, that's a double-edged sword, right? Because you can be doing a pen test and find this thing. That's not automatically critical, right? Like, oh man, I found a Niagara AX machine on your network. You know, stop the pen test because it's like oh, game over, right? You, you just don't know. Um, you have to figure out what it's connected to first in order to kind of understand what the real true impact is. So, but you'll find that they're connected to really crazy things sometimes. Um, if you buy one of these, you'll actually get this packing slip. Um, I bought this secondhand. Um, it was actually a pretty shady transaction. These are, these are actually pretty difficult to find, surprisingly, because they're, they're very high demand. Um, this is not me, obviously. This was actually sold to someone else. Uh, and then I bought it from someone who had nothing to do with the place I was sold to, which was kind of shady, but I bought it anyway. And um, considering that it's so important, right, like uh, they basically <laughs> print the username and password like on the paper. Right, and uh, that's good because this is actually they actually sell this as a security device, right? Like, hey, our security is so awesome. We use Java, so we have no buffer overflows. So, and as soon as I saw that, I was like, way to go, right? Like, like Tritium, that okay, yeah, way, way to go. So awesome, right? Awesome. If you go to actual Fortune 500 and see how this is deployed, you'll find a cabinet somewhere. These are all like some a lot of these machines actually. I think right here are Tritium machines. Right, they're just devices. They're plugged in somewhere, and it's just kind of tucked away. And like this is where they're actually hooked into the devices and put power and all that sort of stuff. And then there's a network cable somewhere that goes and actually connects it to the network. Right. So some people say that this is segregation. Right. They'll be like, you cannot get to the device from the network. Right. But that that's actually not true because if you know where these are on the network, then you can just get to these and then get to the devices. Right. So because these will. Um, depending on how they're connected, may not be IP or whatever, but uh, this is not segregation, right? So, but a lot of people will claim that this is. So now we're going to talk a little bit about who uses this stuff. Um, if, you're, if you go to Shodan and you say, hey, I'm interested in tri Tritium Niagara or Niagara servers, it's really good because Tritium decided to include their own like server tag right here that says, hey, I am a Tritium Niagara AX framework device of some sort. And, uh, and sometimes it can be on a regular like Windows or Linux machine. Other, most of the times it's going to be on an embedded device somewhere, right? I ran this search, I think, a year ago when uh, I was working with DHS, and we were trying to figure out how prevalent or how how big of a deal the issue was that we reported to them, the uh, the session identification thing, and like the basically the privilege escalation bug, right? So if if you look, there's about 12,000 of them in the US and like a couple hundred you know, other places. So all total, there's probably like around 25,000 maybe total on the internet, just kind of facing different places. Uh, and this is the obvious ones, right? Just super obvious. We know that they, they'll just get owned. So I ran this search this morning, right? I'm like, ah, I wonder if it's going up or down. And it's actually going up, right? There, more of these devices are actually coming onto the scene. So, and that's not good. But the good thing is, is that when you query these things, it'll actually tell you what version they're running, right? And so, as we saw, um, the update that came out updated 3.5 and 3.6, right? So maybe this guy right here is okay, maybe. Um, but these other guys here, like they're not in good shape, right? They are not in good shape. So and so, like when we look at who's using this stuff, like Beck Superior Hybrids, right? I mean, this is just three of, you know, like. A bunch, right? Like 16, 17,000 in the U.S., 1,000 in Canada. So, like, like, who? What type of people run this stuff on the internet, right? So, that's because it's kind of weird. I'm interested. Um, these are the folks that have their tritium boxes exposed to the internet. People like this, right? It's like schools, churches, like stuff like this, right? Where you can just basically log in. I don't know what it's connected to, but I'm I'm guessing that's not good, right? Like, it's some farm somewhere, so. I'm sure, they, I'm sure they got super elite uh, security team tracking this stuff down. So if you actually go to their management portal, like if you go to like the management portal to actually manage one of these things, the first thing you'll see is this uh, Java applet download dialog. So that basically concludes this talk, right? Like you see the Java, you see the Java download dialog, like it's, it's like it's, it's game over, right? Like, okay, you're required to install Java in order to use this thing, right? Like that's that's not that's not good, right? You're basically in an indefensible position. So, and then once you accept that, you'll see some dialogue like this that says, "Okay, yeah, we're going to download more jars, right?" So, a bunch of them. 
Um, and then once you get all the way in, you'll see something like this, right? It's like beautiful screen that shows someone's uh, environmental controls or something like that saying, hey, here's all the stuff that you're managing. And th here's the temperature for today, 80 degrees. You know, like, oh, okay, that's cool. Uh, when you start drilling down, you'll actually get to see some of the components that you're actually managing, right? Like, hey, this is the HVAC, this is the main air handler, floor one, floor two, floor three, floor four, whatever. So, um, but also what happens on your machine, on the machine that's actually doing the administration, um, it's going to have that directory, the Niagara directory, written to a user folder. So, and people who do like Windows pen tests know that usually writing stuff to a user folder that's not kind of ackled correctly is, is pretty bad. Right, because a lot of folks probably have access to that thing, a lot of different programs, whatever. And then inside the Niagara folder is written two other folders, one called credentials, one called WB applet. So we won't talk too much about the credentials folder, but um, the WB applet folder has these other folders in there, of which the modules folder has like 50 jars, 50 of them, right? So there's a full blown app that's running on the client side. It looks like a web page. But actually, most of the stuff is actually happening in these applets. So, and yeah, here's a screenshot, right? Like, I'm like, oh, yeah, I gotta get show everyone a screenshot of this stuff of the type of crap that they have in here, right? It's just ridiculous amounts of stuff they're doing on the client side, like ridiculous amounts of stuff on the client. Like, like yeah, like what? Like, don't we have like web servers that do that? Anyways, um, the credentials folder, they create another folder inside the credentials folder that's a hash. I won't even tell you what the hash is. Because obviously you need a folder with people's hat. Like I won't even get it. So, <laughs> but if you log it, this is the demo site that they have. So anyone can go to this thing, take a look at it. This is what you'll see. Um, if you look up at the URL, there's some interesting stuff up there, uh, and then there's some like pretty pictures and stuff, which probably made this framework so popular, right? Um, the most important thing is like if you take a look, it says ORD, that thing right there, ORD. Um, there's a lot of different weird concepts in this world. But I just want to touch on one. So if you're doing a pen test or something like that and you come across one of these, um, so you kind of understand this. An ORD is the object resolution descriptor. So and basically what's happening is like anything that's specified with an ORD is getting mapped to some function somewhere, usually on the server, on the server side, right? So it's kind of telling it what it should do. So and that's what this description is all about here. But here's some examples of ORDs. And these ORDs are not what you'll see in the URL. These are the ORDs that are actually executed by the framework itself and they can hand it off to functions and such. So uh, the ORD's going to tell the device, hey, where did this request come from? Did it come from an IP address? Is it the local machine? Is it dial-up? Whatever, right? And then it's going to say, like, who is this supposed to go to, like the host? Uh, and then it's, gonna, he's got, it's got this other functionality, like Fox, file, module, spy, all this sort of stuff. And those are the things that are actually mapped to functions that do things. So, and you can create your own. So, but, they have a really cool ORD, and you can get to this on the web pages to just enumerate and dump all of them. So and they're, they're mapped to a function somewhere, so that's kind of neat. Um, and basically, the way that it works is like if you see a URL like that, all the URL, all that happens is that URL is just going to get transformed into an ORD, and then that ORD is going to get passed to a function somewhere. So I'm just trying to map that and show you how that kind of works. So um, this is that thing that shows you who are all the ORDs that are installed. And this, this shows you something that's really interesting because like, if you drill down, it's actually telling you what the interface is for like that API, right? It's saying like, hey, that ORD that you're trying to access, it accepts this type, it, it does this thing, it does all this sort of stuff. So it's almost like you're programming, right? You're just interfacing APIs basically and just passing values to APIs to execute certain functionality. So there's tons of stuff here. For example, like they don't consider these vulnerabilities like, because this is actually run against a demo server. We're like, hey, dude, we're going to run this against your demo. They're like, okay, that's functionality. Like, you can say, hey, you know what? Show me what standard out is, right? And it gets passed to some API, and like standard out gets returned, right? And so this is like the Java standard out, right? Like, this is stuff that's just getting printed, like debug statements, all that sort of stuff, uh, getting printed out here. And this is by design. These aren't vulnerabilities. It's like, this is by design, right? So um, if you want to say, hey, you know what? I want to see all the connections that are currently connected to the box, whatever. It just says, yeah, here's all the connections. And here's the local name, right? Like, so that's my laptop right there, actually. Like, that's the host name of my laptop. The host name, not the IP address. Like, the host name, because it's this applet that's shooting all this data back to the server, right? So, because they have code running on my machine. And here's the other people that were connected, and when they were connected, and the stuff that they did, right? And this stuff is by design, because you just have to access the right APIs. So the, the more you know about the APIs, like, the more you'll know about manipulating the built-in functionality for these devices. So. 
So back to the directory traversal, right? Usually directory traversal is like a dot, dot, slash type thing. Um, that didn't work here. So, but we know that we have certain orgs that serve files. So, and those are like the natural, obvious attack surface for something like a directory traversal. So, and all we have to do, all we have to do is figure out like, hey, file, where does that go to? When I say file, what does that do on the Niagara backend, right? And so what really happens is it gets, gets passed to Java X, Baja file, BI file, right? And so now we know we can control things that are getting past that particular API. And we also know that this char character right there, that just says, hey, you know what? I want you to use the user absolute directory. And we just look at the definition for the user absolute directory, and we find that the user absolute directory is actually one directory below the web root. So the stuff that's web accessible, it's actually one directory below that, right? And then we know that the config.bog file is actually in that directory. So we can just request it and download it. And once we download it, we know it's compressed, we uncompress it, and then we can take a look at the XML file, and it's like all game over, right? But all this stuff is just mapped to like all these different functions and stuff. And so um, it seems like it's a pretty straightforward web app vulnerability, because you've seen them like 100 times before. But in these cases, it's just a little bit different, right? So it's kind of neat. So all we had to do is just enumerate all these things, right? So if we're saying, hey, if I pass a char character to file, what does that mean? That means user absolute. But we enumerated the other ones too, right? We could say, hey, slash slash to the absolute authority. Uh, just a regular slash to the local absolute. You know, uh, a pound, it means that's like, like sys absolute, which is actually the very, sys, the, like, the very root of the device. Uh, and then of course there's caret, and if you just say, specify a file, it's all obviously relative. And we actually found that it actually does support a dot dot slash notation, but it just doesn't allow you to traverse all the way back up out, outside of the web root, right? So, and here's all the, the functions that are getting called when you pass some of these things in, right? So it can do the lookup and say, hey, this guy said pound something. That actually means system absolute pull a file from this location. And this is by design, right? So this is all by design, right? Like, it's not like they're going to fix this stuff. This is just the way it works. So. And then once you download the file, it's compressed, uncompress it, and now you got all the passwords. So, so there's too much of this stuff to kind of let you know what's going on. In fact, I was going to bring the device in so people could play with it. I was going to hook it up to the network and just let people pound on it. But I'm in the middle of like some other research, and I'm like, I better, I should probably not let other people mess with it while I'm in the middle of this. So, but uh, if you're interested in looking at this stuff, like the applets or the jars or whatever, like I have those. You don't need a device to actually look at those, and you can just start going through those. And the first two minutes, you'll be appalled. And then like after that, you'll just start finding bugs, right? So because I'm certain that those jars probably have some kind of code execution vulnerability in it, right? I mean, it's Java. You won't get memory corruption out of it. But um, there's just so much functionality in there, including download functionality, where someone might be able to, let, let's say, download an arbitrary file to an arbitrary location on the machine and get some kind of code or command execution, right? I'm just saying it might be there. Um, but if you want to look at any one of the 50 jars or so, like I have those with me, so I can just give those to you. Um, the client-side code also generates a lot of weird stuff. Like there's historians that I don't have set up, which is all a historian is, it's just a database. So you'll actually see like jars that do like ODBC, JDBC, or JDBC, the SQL Server, Oracle, whatever. Um, and it also generates client side SQL and passes it to those databases. So that's not good. Credentials are stored in a lot of different places. So you'll be like traversing a jar or something like that, and you'll just see credentials, right? And you're like, whoa. Um, or it's, they're stored in other weird random places. So, And then there's these weird complex interactions between the server and devices that like, I don't really understand yet, right? I'm like watching the traffic go back and forth, and I'm like, I don't really understand that, but it, it doesn't look good. So um, I'm a little bit over, right? But we're on the last talk, so it doesn't matter. Um, and I, perfect, perfect. So if there's any questions, I can take questions at this point. So. All right, that's it. So thanks for, for putting up with my daughter in here.
tickets now, now or never. There is Elvis. Uh, Thank you guys.